I'm going to give you a, a, a talk today that's going to combine uh, some basic ecology with some looking at degradation over various time scales and then trying to combine those two bits of information to think about uh, ways that uh, we can um, further advance our approaches to uh, conservation, um, approaches to con marine conservation. So um, I'm going to do a little bit now on just some basic ecology. A lot of you, basic community ecology, a lot of you may be familiar with the um, different ways um, that people have tried to characterize the maintenance of species in ecological communities. Um, there's Gleason's ideas of individualistic and the climax communities of um, Clemens. Um, Hutchinson's um, Santa Rosalia question, why are there so many species? and all the way to the, uh, the present stuff with uh, Steve Hubble's Neutral Theory of Biodiversity. I'm going to um, sort of go through um, each one of these in a minute, but I just wanted to uh, stress to you that um, the, the, um, the question of, of what, what maintains communities, how they're assembled, uh, is really an important one because it represents how, how the foundations of how they're structured, how, how they build. Because right now, communities are being unbuilt, they're being destructured. We're doing a lot to degrade ecosystems. So um, I think there's a tremendous amount that can be gained by actually understanding um, the, process, the fundamental ecological processes in, uh, in communities. And this is, a, this is a slide from Ben Halpern's uh, paper in 2008, which basically shows that there's no place that you can hide. Uh, there's no place to run in the marine environment. There's no place that's untouched uh, from human uh, influences. So um, the, ba there's a very simple outline of the talk today, ecology matters, marine baselines are shifted, and can we use one plus two to um, derive better uh, management actions, more successful uh, approaches to marine management. Right, so I've um, gone over very briefly um, each one of these sort of ecological paradigms. And I just want to explain um, them to you in a little bit uh, more detail because I'm going to show you some, some data that actually uh, I think bears upon the relative influence of these paradigms in coral reef ecology. Um, so the first thing is the Gleasonian communities, uh, very, very much uh, open communities. Uh, species are driven by their own environmental characteristics. They respond individualistically to environmental uh, parameters. Um, and so you get, in effect, um, associations of species that are, are very different in time and space. And it just so happens to be whatever species are occupying that particular um, place at that particular time. Um, one of the, the key papers that sort of showed uh, this to be the case in the plant literature was from Margaret Davis and, and a whole bunch of work that she's done over her career. But basically that showed over the last uh, deglaciation that there was uh, different starting points in North America for different kinds of uh, trees and different rates of uh, migration. So that um, all these different uh, species are responding uh, differently to climate change. Uh, and so, you know, you, you get these communities that are um, not really coherent and they may vary um, from place to place from time to time based on those uh, individual physiological uh, preferences. Uh, the Clemencian community is very, very much different. They're very much closed communities. Um, biotic, um, there's a single climax community. The, the, the organisms are um, tightly integrated. There's a lot of bi biotic interaction. Um, where you get breaks in, in ecotones, you, you, you tend to get um, a similar distribution of species over the entire uh, ecotone, uh, a break, and then another set of species. So uh, within habitats, um, community structure is meant to be uh, fairly persistent in space and time, and it's because of this um, biotic interaction. Clemens has even sort of referred to these as these communities as superorganisms. Now, both of these are two caricatures at the end of a uh, spectrum, and obviously the world probably doesn't work like either one of them. But um, the idea is try to understand, um, um, or to show you today, how coral reefs fit into this this kind of thinking. Uh, and then the last thing that's come along in the last 10 or 15 years or so has been Steve Hubble's uh, Neutral Theory of Biodiversity, where uh, he ascribes uh, everything 
um, to um, chance events and demographic stochasticity. So that, what does that mean? That means every individual in the community has the same probability of birth, death, immigration, and speciation. So not, it's, not, it's not even every species the same, it's every individual in the community the same. Now we all know that that's absurd. Steve Hubble knows it's absurd. But he says, how much can we explain of the pattern by making these assumptions? So it provides a really nice uh, null model. The other assumption in the model is that when an individual dies, its space is immediately taken up by another individual. So it's, it's a zero-sum sort of uh, game. So I'll talk about um, these, these three um, these theories, I guess, in, or choral communities and try to uh, put them in the context of, uh, in this sort of uh, theoretical context. And I'm going to do that by uh, focusing on coral reefs, which is a, 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 a system that I'm most familiar with and I, I like to spend time in and I'm most concerned about. Um, they only make up about 0.2% of the world's oceans, but yet they have about 25% of the, of the of marine biodiversity, so they sort of um, far uh, outweigh their, their aerial extent. They punch above their weight, I guess. Um, fairly unique ecosystems, but they're very threatened. The three major um, threats to coral reefs are um, basically over-exploitation, overfishing, and this sort of thing, um, pollution by coastal development and land use changes, and also the emerging threat of, of climate change. Um, so I guess with these threats and with a lot of the coral reefs around the world uh, being characterized as you know, not, not being in very good health, if you like to use that term, uh, there's some sense of, uh, of urgency about trying to understand what the ecology is of these, of these uh, ecosystems and how we can use that information uh, for management. Um, so what happens on coral reefs? This is a, um, a summary of a study by Joe Connell who went up to Heron Island for about 30 years in a row and got information at a quadrat scale level on the reef flat at uh, Heron Island. And, and, and a few different uh, habitats, reef crest, exposed pools, uh, inner reef flats, uh, et cetera. And what he found was a tremendous amount of variation uh, from year to year in the percent coverage of corals. Uh, some years had very high cover, other years had very low cover. And these arrows here are, um, are when, the uh, sorry, when cyclones came through and sort of reset the, the, the clock for, for, these, um, for the percent cover on these, from these quadrats. So um, a lot of people sort of gathered from this work that, that uh, species composition is very variable, unpredictable on coral reefs. Coral reefs are disturbance-driven systems that never reach an equilibrium state. And it's, it's been the, the, the dominant sort of paradigm in, in coral reef ecology for a long time, and it probably uh, um, still is to some extent. Um, but um, I, I decided to go and have a look and interview the fossils and see what they had to say about this um, sort of um, uh, th this sort of pattern. So um, I, I wanted to look at the patterns of species distribution, um, and, and, and I'm going to tell you what I what I what I'm going to tell you, um, and basically that the, the fossils uh, give us a whole lot more predictability and a whole lot more order than what we might assume from looking at the short-term studies of uh, people like uh, Joe Connell. Um, the distinction is really important because if it doesn't matter what species are where, and you have these ephemeral assemblages that are constantly in disequilibrium, then your management strategies are going to be very different than if you have a coherent set of taxa that are persistent in space and time and that you can predict um, what those tax are going to be. Uh, so your management strategies might, might alter in that case to focusing on the key taxa that, that make up those, the, those communities that are known to persist in time. So I wanted to find out what, what, is the, um, you know, what is the persistence of these assemblages in the fossil record. And um, what, I spent a lot of time up on the Huon Peninsula in Papua New Guinea and the reason why is because there's a series of terraces up there. The locals call them the giant's steps. And the terraces occur through the interaction of local tectonic uplift and quaternary sort of uh, uh, sea level oscillations throughout the, um, throughout the quaternary. So um, a lot of you might have taken you know, rocks for jocks or uh, introductory geology course and you learned that the oldest rocks are on the bottom and the youngest are on the top. But in fact, the youngest rocks are on the bottom here and the oldest ones are on the top because the terraces keep uplifting. 
But basically, um, you can get lots of experiments of how communities assemble through time. I'm not going to talk about Papua New Guinea today, but I'm going to talk about a similar uh, situation in Barbados, which is the easternmost island uh, in the Caribbean Sea. And in Barbados, you also have a series of terraces. These are uh, topographic contours. You can see the terraces going up the western side of the island and on the southern side of the island. I focused on four um, time periods. Ka means thousands of years ago. That's so 104, 125, 195 and 220,000 years ago, and I asked the question, how similar are those coral communities uh, over each one of those reef building events in a particular habitat? In this case, we'll focus on the reef crest habitat, shallow four reef, it's about two to five or six meters in water depth. So um, <clears throat> you can think of this as four separate ecological experiments of sort of rerunning the tape. There's a nice paper called Rerunning the Tape that somebody wrote in ecology a few years back. And that's what we're doing. We're just sort of seeing how these communities assemble because the sea level falls and leaves the terraces and the reefs high and dry. And when the sea level comes up again, you basically start a brand new reef and you can look at what the, um, what the community composition is um, after, after that sea level <coughs> event. So four time periods over about 115,000 years and looking at um, species relative abundance data. So we can go out and we can census the, uh, the corals. This just gives you an idea of the relative sea level between the four. This is 220, 195, 125, and 104. Slightly different temperature and CO2 um, conditions in these, in these uh, four reef building episodes. Nothing too dramatic compared to what's happening today, but, but um, some, some variability in those interglacial uh, periods. So how do you get data? Well, you, you, you basically do it the same way you do when you uh, go out on a modern um, marine transect. You, lay, you, know, you put on your scuba gear and you lay down the transect, except in this case, you don't have to put on the scuba gear and you can just stay out there for hours and hours. And, and take lots of transects, and we, and we census the corals along these transects. Okay, so uh, the Caribbean is a, <coughs> it's a nice place to work because there's only about 80 species of coral, as opposed to uh, about in New Guinea, we're, we're, uh, the species diversity is about 400 species of coral. So we could actually identify the, the species uh, in the field and brought some back that we couldn't identify uh, and, and later identified. But for the most part, we could get our data in the, in the field. So um, basically, we use the kind of techniques where we compare uh, samples with uh, species, sorry, species lists and how abundant they are in the samples. And we do, we compare every sample to every other one using Bray Curtis. And uh, we can do ANASIM, um, which is a, a, um, a significance test, um, stat test to see how similar the groups of samples are. And we use ordination to sort of visually um, have a look at how similar the samples are. And I'm just going to show you <coughs> this ordination, which shows, again, the four different um, time periods. And you can see that it's basically a shotgun on, on the ordination. That the, each one of these dots are a particular transect from a particular time period of coral composition. And the dots that are closest to each other are more similar in their coral community composition than dots that are far apart from one another. And you can see there's a quite a range of variability, um, which is to be expected in natural systems, but, but there's also uh, pretty much broad overlap in the composition of those communities through time. And the anison bears it out. There's um, um, very little uh, differences among these different time periods. Um, now, you can do the same thing uh, through space. And so you can look at each one of these time periods, and then you can look at distance to decay curves and look how the similarity among the communities um, declines or not through time. So the y-axis is the Bray Curtis similarity. Um, assemblages that are more uh, similar are up here, more dissimilar down here. And this is just a distance. Um, this is, I think, in, in degrees. But this is, a, um, this is about 25 kilometers across here. <coughs> so none of the regressions are significant here. The, uh, the curves are all flat. So these assemblages, not only are they similar through time, but within any one time, the assemblages are fairly similar in space as well. Okay, so much larger degree of order and predictability to these assemblages than what we find in Connell's work, say, on Heron Island. 
Right, so um, then we wanted to sort of have a look at, um, compare this data now to the neutral theory and say, okay, well, well, maybe they're all similar, but maybe that's just what you'd expect from a neutral distribution. So I got a hold of some uh, modelers, um, Michael Bode, who <coughs> is now in the Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, and also Sean Connolly, and we worked together to um, try to put this data in a, the context of the neutral theory and have a look at whether the neutral theory <coughs> applies to this data. Excuse me. So here's four plots of the same thing, and it's occupancy on, on the left, that is the proportion of sites uh, of local communities in which each species is present, and on the x-axis is the relative abundance of that particular species in the meta-community. So, and the red dots are the modeled uh, neutral theory and the black dots are the observed uh, species. And what you can see here is that the, um, the, the, all the observed abundances, uh, occupancy falls below what you might expect from a, a neutral curve. So basically there's many fewer species occupying each one of these communities than what the neutral theory uh, would predict. So it's a, it's a subset of the, of the species that could live there actually do live there. So again, a, um, looking at sort of more of a, of a structured kind of <coughs> populations. Observed species are consistently less widespread than what the neutral theory uh, would hold. You can also look at the, um, the rank abundance plots. The rank abundance plots, you can see a lot uh, um, the relative abundance on the y-axis and their rank on the x-axis. And you notice that in all these plots, the, the, the highest rank species are much more abundant, the black, the black line which is observed, than what is predicted by the neutral theory. The other thing that you see is there's more rarity in the neutral models, in the neutral communities, than there is in nature. <coughs> so the long and the short of it is, is that the neutral theory is a poor predictor of, um, of the species uh, rank distributions uh, than the, um, is a poor predictor for the, observed, for the observed patterns. So we didn't really see that that was a, uh, a good model to apply. Um, we went one step further and we asked, are there demographic um, properties about the corals that might um, counter this whole assumption about species being equal, or at least the fact that species aren't equal not making a difference. And so what we did was we plotted the abundance of the taxa against their growth rates and the occupancy of the taxa against their growth rates. And we find that the taxa with the highest occupancy and the highest abundance, which are the acroporas, the big branching corals, fast growing, are the ones that are um, have the highest occupancy and the highest abundance. So um, higher growth rates are more characteristic of highly abundant and, high, and widespread taxa, and there's really good reason for that. They're better competitors. They grow fast, they, they grow over top of the other corals, they, uh, they outcompete, they can even outcompete the algae. Um, they, are, they are sort of the super competitors in corals of the coral world. Okay, so this distribution here is not a random distribution. It's very much structured according to growth rates, uh, which goes against any notion that species are all equal. They're not. Okay, so to summarize that um, sort of part of the talk, uh, we find ecological persistence in these Pleistocene coral communities, minimal differences in the relative abundance of these coral species, over 115,000 years, uh, the flat distance decay curves, oops, um, and the demographic stochasticity uh, is rejected. So um, there's predictability, there's some order to the assembly of these reef coral communities. Right, so now let's go to the second part of the talk and think about what was natural. And I'm going to go through several vignettes about sort of what was natural in some of these coral reef ecosystems from Barbados, the Caribbean, the Great Barrier Reef, in, and Moreton Bay. And hopefully I'll have enough time to get through them. Um, so let's go back to our ordination in Barbados. And here's, here's those uh, four assemblages, the shotgun graph that I showed earlier. Lots of variability, but pretty much on top of one another, not too much difference. <coughs> 
Well, what happens if you compare those assemblages with assemblages that were taken, sorry, with surveys that were taken in the modern in 1987, way back in 1987, um, and plot those in the ordination? Well, this is what happens. All that variation that you see um, goes down to almost a single point, and the modern communities are very much in some kind of different ordination space. Okay? So what we're seeing in the modern is something completely different than what was characteristic of these assemblages over this 115,000 year interval. As a matter of fact, um, I have other data that shows that th these, these, assemblage, these kinds of assemblages go back half a million years on Barbados. So you've got half a million years of a similar sort of coral composition that has now uh, been shifted um, uh, dramatically in the modern. Well, is Barbados the only place that, that this occurs? These are our two friends. This is Acropora palmata. This is Acropora cervicornis. These are the really fast-growing, dominant corals in the, in the Caribbean. Um, I did a, a, a literature survey and asked the question, what percentage of Caribbean sites in this shallow water zone are dominated by Acropora palmata? And what percentage of these sites for the deeper water zone are dominated by cervicornis? during four different time periods, Pleistocene, Holocene, before the 1980s and after the 1980s. And you can see that in the Pleistocene and the Holocene that the Acroporas dominated their respective habitats uh, almost everywhere in the Caribbean. But by the time we got to the 1980s and then even post uh, during that time, there was a dramatic decline in the occurrence of these species as dominant components of the ecosystem. So Barbados isn't alone in having undergone this degradation or this shift in community composition, um, this recent shift in community composition. Okay, <clears throat> so the next place now I want to transport you is to uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And we've been, um, uh, I've been involved with a project uh, over the last three years or so uh, doing some coring of the uh, inshore reefs of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I've got a team right now that is um, actually not in Prince of Charlotte Bay, but they're, they're up here almost to the tip of Cape York and uh, working there. We've got um, cores from Cairns uh, reefs, from the Palm Islands, a few from the Whitsundays, from the Keppel Islands, and then also Harvey Bay and Morton Bay further south. <coughs> so it's this pretty comprehensive um, latitudinal study looking at, um, well, it's looking at several, several questions. Uh, first, what are the environmental changes on the inshore Great Barrier Reefs over, over broad temporal scales? And by broad temporal scales, we mean the last uh, couple of thousands of years. What are the ecological changes uh, associated with those environmental changes? And then how do these inshore GBR communities respond to environmental change? And I'm going to give you some um, uh, um, example of, of, of uh, some of that work just now. So we go to Polaris Island in the Palm Islands <coughs> here, and we're looking at coral life, death, and fossil assemblages. Coral life assemblages, I'm sure most of you would know, whatever's living on the sea floor. Death assemblages are just the sort of the fragments and the rubble uh, adjacent to those life assemblages that are also on the sea floor. And then the fossil assemblages uh, we actually core for. So we actually put uh, cores, and I'll show you how we do that through the sediment, and then we uh, reconstruct what the communities look like over time. So here is um, Polaris Island. Uh, three sites we, we have on the leeward side of the island. All of our sites are around about five meters water depth. We find that is a comfortable um, depth to work. Um, and they're always on the leeward side. And this gives you an idea that the, the what the sites look like. Basically, this is a... Um, you know, a, a cemetery of acroporid corals here at site A and site C as well. It's a cemetery of, of branching rubbly coral. Site B, you have, um, I introduce you please to another friend called Pavona. This is a live Pavona and there's bunches of live and dead Pavona uh, at, at this site B here. So I'm only going to ask you to memorize two names, uh, Acropora and Pavona. Okay, and Acropora is the branching one and Pavona is this sort of leafy looking thing here. <coughs> so 
we went around and we, um, we censused the life assemblages and then we collected the death assemblages, brought them back to the lab and identified them. And when you do that, basically the long and the short of it is that Acropora is a much larger component of the death assemblages at site A and C um, than it is in the life assemblages. And if you just look at the structure at A and C, the community structure of those two sites, you see that the life assemblages are very different from the death assemblages. Um, at the middle site, site B, Pavona was present in both the life and the death assemblages, but Acropora was only present in the death assemblage. So Acropora was living there before, but seems not to be living there very well right now. This is just some details that I don't have time to go into that concern the kind of acroporas that were there and how thick their branches were, but I'd be happy to talk to you about that later. So um, there was this shift, right? So we've, we've gone from, um, no, from acropora to no acropora. So the idea is, well, it begs the question, when did that happen? So we have to go and we have to date the corals. And I, I'm very, very fortunate that I work with um, Professor Jan Shin Zhao at the University of Queensland who runs the radioisotopic facility. And he is a pioneer in gaining uranium thorium dates from corals that are very, very young. Um, we've, we've been able to do it with old corals for quite some time, but Jan Shin has been really instrumental and forged ahead with, with doing it with young samples. So we collect the corals, we, um, we um, clean them, and we stick them in these fancy um, mass spectrometer machines, and we can actually sort of date these things with a very, very high degree of accuracy and precision. So here's a coral that we dated. Uh, one of my PhD students is holding up underwater. 1986 down here, plus or minus one year. 1997 up here, plus or minus two years. So the, the precision on this stuff is really, really amazing. Um, <clears throat> so we went out and we collected a whole bunch of coral rubble. We randomly sampled it at sites uh, A and um, uh, what is it? Site A and C. Uh, basically, all we were able to get is was a cropera, and at site B, uh, we mostly could only get pavona. And if you look at the age distribution of the samples that we dated, uh, this is a relative probability plot, which just takes your all your your dates and gives you the most. Uh, it's a weighted mean approach that gives you the most um, parsimonious um, uh, date for that assemblage. And so at one of the sites, the, the dates are falling near around 1938. And this is, and this is, a cal this is like the year 1938. And uh, for the other site, site A, 1945. So I want you to remember that as well, around the 1930s, 1940s. Whereas with Pavona, um, yeah, there, were, there seemed to be a signal from the 1998 uh, bleaching event, but really there's, there seems to be a fairly constant turnover in Pavona life and, and um, death assemblages at this site. So you get a broad range of corals over the last 20 or 30 years, broad range of dates. So this appears just to be a, a population of Pavona that's just sort of ticking along and ticking over. So <clears throat> we've got this, um, we've got this, um, this sort of um, mortality, concentration of mortality, um, and the question now becomes, we know when it happened, the question now becomes, did it happen before? Is this just something, uh, is this something anomalous, or is this something as part of like a cyclic sort of thing that's a natural phenomenon that occurs throughout the history of the reef? So to, so to answer that, we go to the cores. And this just gives you a, um, uh, a, a sense of how the cores, we bring these five meter long aluminum tubes down to the seafloor. That's why it's convenient to work in about five meters of water. It, we've got a, a collar over, the, over the, the tube and then we, so we bang the tube into the substrate. We cap the top of the tube when we're done. We attach lift bags and then we use grunt work to sort of lift it out of the sediment. And when it's finally lifted out, we cap the bottom and then we swim the core uh, up to the support vessel, and so that's how we. Do. It's all grunt work, you know. It's just basically pounding these things in <coughs> into the sediment. So, um, you know, the, the, these these things are only you know a few hundreds to a few thousands of years old. So, the preservation is absolutely spectacular. We can identify these the species uh, within these cores down to the down to the uh, species level. 
Um, but when you're doing a dissertation in Australia in 3.5 years, you um, tend to do things at the genus level instead of the species level because coral taxonomy is not a straightforward enterprise. So this, this study was done at, uh, by the way, every study I've ever done in my life, I could have done at the genus level because I've always gotten the same results at the genus level of the species. I'd be interested to hear whether that other people have the same experience. Anyway, so, um, and this just gives you a feel for <coughs> the stratigraphy within the cores and the amount of time averaging and things that we had to deal with, um, which wasn't much. Because we chose the leeward sides of, of these islands, protected um, sides, we generally got a very nice um, sequence, temporal sequence. This one is embarrassingly um, um, correct, going from 1865, 1877, 1885, 87, 89. It's a, it's a beautiful temporal sequence. Um, <clears throat> and I think you don't, you know, in there you don't see any storm layers or any major disturbance. You don't see any bioturbation. Um, we really have a system here that is, lends itself very nicely to looking at sort of um, sequential trends through time. Right, so what do you do? You open up those cores, put half of them in refrigeration for posterity in case somebody else wants to do something fancy with them uh, in, at some future date. And what we've done here is to characterize the coral genera. So the red is Acropora, our friend Acropora, and the blue is our friend Pavona, okay? So let's go back up to sites uh, A, and down to site C, and you can see that Acropora basically dominated these cores for hundreds of years, and even down to uh, a thousand years. These are calendar dates, so that's 846 um, CE, 266 CE, so these are, these are um, ranging almost um, you know, 2,000 years in, in that instance. So Acropora was dominating early on and dominated throughout, the, um, throughout those the time at those sites. Now, at our site B, which you recall was pretty much live and dead Pavona, um, we do find the Pavona. That's the Pavona that we would have sampled at the top of the, those death assemblages. But look at this. Look how Acropora had dominated these, these reefs prior to Pavona coming on site. And when did, it, when did Pavona begin to dominate? 1935, plus or minus 7, 1941. One plus or minus something, 1936. These are the same ages that we found with the death assemblages, right? So those cores are picking up that transition at site B, where we're going from Acropora dominated to Pavona dominated. So again, a dramatic shift in community composition. Um, we suspect that it's related to uh, European colonization. Uh, this is some work that was done by Malcolm McCulloch. Uh, using barium as a proxy for, for um, uh, river discharge on the Great Barrier Reef. And he reckons that the, 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 the river discharge really, and, the amount of, and, and therefore the amount of flooding on the GBR, really um, dramatically increased from about 1870 onward. And this corresponds nicely to the, um, you know, to the colonization of the Queensland coastline. And the, land, and the subsequent land use changes that, are, that have occurred there. Now, you know, in a lot of this stuff, it's not, you know, a lot of people want to know, well, what killed the corals? You know, what killed the corals? But in, in reality, there, there's a more interesting question is, it's not necessarily what killed them, but why aren't they recovering? So, so you know, it, we don't have a smoking gun in 1936, 1945, or, or whatever. You know, there's, there's obviously lag times, and there's, there's sediment, lots of things happening on land. But what's really interesting now is, that since about that time, the coral's been unable to recover. Those acropolis have been unable to, to go back in and form those reefs. So one can look at and put a timeline together uh, on the inshore reefs of the GBR based on this kind of information, a little model. And if you think about European colonization, we started off with fishing um, and then probably had water quality changes, a bit of habitat destruction, and it wasn't until uh, later on where we get these other things like climate change, disease, and acidification. And the question becomes, uh, when, you know, when did this sort of stuff occur? And, and basically with our dates, I think we can put our dates somewhere along here. So we're probably looking at uh, changes in water quality 
a uh, bit of habitat destruction associated with European colonization that is basically bringing our assemblages that once looked like this and now look like this. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, GVR summary, unprecedented shifts in coral community dominance, uh, significant decline in our branching acropora corals, post-dated European settlement, but it predated recent climate change and increase in disease. So we can actually sort of narrow our uh, field of potential drivers of this degradation, okay, by looking into the fossil record. Um, okay, so let's uh, do um, another example, uh, and that's in Morton Bay, Queensland, which is uh, right off the coast of Brisbane, um, where, where I live. And um, we did a similar sort of study of some, uh, some of the reefs in, in Morton Bay. This is Morton Bay. This is kind of a, a blow up of the area where the reefs occur um, um, and where we did some coring along Wellington Point, along Peel Island, and uh, along Myora, Myora Reef next to North um, Stradbrook Island, uh, sorry, South Stradbrook Island. South? North. I'm confused now. John, which is it? <laughs> North Stradbrook Island. <laughs> Um, and these are our um, coring, coring sort of sites. Again, same thing, you know, bring the, bring the cores in and, and pound them in, except you, you could do most of this standing, standing up in the water. Okay, so um, actually, sorry to confuse you, but I'm not going to present the evidence from the coring today. I'm just going to present the evidence from the death assemblages. So this is same sites where we went um, to, to each one of these and we collected the the death assemblages on the seafloor. You just collect a whole bunch of rubble and bring it back. And we dated it. <coughs> and this is, the, this is the sort of pattern that we, uh, that we came up with. So this is um, a 7,000 year record. So 2000, the year 2000 now, uh, zero, and then going back 5,000 before zero. So it's a 7,000 year record. And there's three really interesting patterns that we got from our, our dating. And the first one is that the, um, the, the corals that were living earlier on were living, living in shallower water than the ones living today. The fact that this is um, positive numbers just reflects some of our sampling was up on top of the coral keys. Um, but in a relative sense, we've lost about four meters of, of water depth in where these corals are living. Two of those meters you can ascribe to sea level change. So sea levels drop by two meters. But the other two meters, we suspect, has something to do with the interaction between the sea level changes and the onset of the modern day ENSO effects uh, within the bay. And the bay is a very, um, uh, very sensitive to slight changes in sea level and uh, precipitation because it has a very narrow outlet in the southern end and is only really open to the ocean in the northern part. So small changes in circulation can have uh, um, dramatic <coughs> changes to the communities and, uh, and, and fresh water input as well. <coughs> so that's the first thing, the depth changes. The second thing is that you'll notice that the age dates are concentrated in certain bands. And we have four what we call reef building episodes or reef growth episodes throughout that interval and three um, places in the white where there is no reef growth. Okay, and you can do, um, uh, Matt has done this, we published this in Frontiers, um, fancy Poisson distribution analysis and these are, these are well and truly ep episodes of no real reef growth separated by these episodes of reef growth. So for about half the time over the last 7,000 years, naturally, there has been no reef growth in the, in the bay. And about half the time, there has been. The last sort of interesting trend that we found was that if you look at the, the um, death assemblages, the composition of the death assemblages, and we denote the acroporas, the faster growing uh, acroporas in yellow and the slower growing favias and other massive corals in green, you notice that the proportion of branching corals was the same for about um, 6,000 years during that 7,000 year interval. And only very recently, as a matter of fact, only in the last um, 
400 years or so have we gotten a switch from a cropper dominated to this slower growing favia dominated situation. Does that sound familiar? Right. So we're getting another sort of dramatic change in community composition that temporally matches up with the um, uh, colonization, European colonization of the Queensland coastline. So um, there are the trends all um, uh, together for you. Again, the branching corals dominating early on, but now uh, not any longer. So Morton Bay, reef development is highly sensitive to subtle environmental changes. The bay sort of acts um, to magnify those, those environmental changes and the effects on the, on the um, development of reefs are very pronounced. So that in the last 7,000 years, you could basically flip a coin as to whether you're gonna get reef growth or not. Um, even where the reefs are developed, the depth of growth was governed by small changes in the bay circulation, and now we have um, um, uh, deeper, deeper uh, reefs are in deeper water. Uh, and again, our unprecedented shifts in community dominance, significant decline in branching corals, nothing to do really with any effects of climate change. Um, this is something that happened far uh, long ago. Um, you know, several hundred years ago and associated with um, European colonization. Okay, so what can we take from those first two sorts of sets of information and try to uh, apply to marine management? I'm gonna talk about two things specifically. Um, first of all, what do we conserve? And secondly, how do we conserve it? And the second thing is just a few words at the end about this idea of assisted migration or managed translocation, that is moving, actually actively moving animals or plants to new places as a response to impending uh, climate change. So what, what to conserve? Well, <clears throat> some people, uh, I think I alluded to earlier, have suggested that we, we really don't know uh, what we should conserve because um, you know, coral assemblages are ephemeral. They vary from time to time, from place to place. So it's a mugs game to try to identify which species are, are key to those ecosystems. We should just let them, um, you know, let them go basically because they're, they're, uh, they're, that's what's gonna happen to them anyway. Um, but you know, I'd argue that we do know what to conserve because the long history of the, uh, the fossil data uh, sort of pretty much uh, tells us what to conserve. In the Caribbean, it's obvious those assemblages were dominated by those Acroporas, uh, and they've lost out recently. On Polaris Island, those assemblages were dominated by Acropora, they've lost out recently. Same thing happened in Morton Bay. We've got a long history where we know what the, the corals were, and they were very similar through time. So I think we can use this information when we start to think about um, um, goals, not specific sort of goals, like we want to get 30% acropora or 80% acropora because there's too many other social, economic, and other kinds of uh, constraints associated with that. Not only that, we all know that you can't go back, you can't go back to the Garden of Eden, you can't even go back to the same ecological state as you had just because environments are always changing. So that's not the idea. But what the idea is to use this sort of framework as a context for trying to make decisions about how we're going to manage these ecosystems. So coral reefs can be managed in the context of a persistent state, I think. It's not all chaotic. And there's significant and important differences between reefs comprised of different corals. Right, then how to conserve? Well, I think in the Caribbean, especially managers can think about trying to restore the processes that are going to facilitate Acropora. And one of the reasons why Acropora hasn't come back is because the macroalgae have overgrown the places that the Acropora used to live. So that's the idea of why they're not recovering. And so what you need to, to get back that space is you need a good herbivore population to start um, really munching down on those macroalgae so the corals actually can recruit into those, into those, uh, uh, back into those areas. Um, this is an example from Jamaica that Terry Hughes published in 2004, where he showed that um, 
over um, you know twenty year period or so, coral cover was very very high initially, and then declined dramatically. While at the same time, uh, macroalgae increased um, at the expense of those corals. And in this particular case, um, diadema, which is the long spine sea urchin, was the main herbivore on those reefs. And diadema had a disease outbreak in 1982-83, where population sizes were decimated by 99%. And so what we all didn't know when, um, or the people who were swimming around the reefs in the late 70s didn't know, is they looked at these beautiful coral reefs, you know, almost 100% coral cover, as they, we didn't have any herbivorous fish. And there's, you know, you take those, you look at those pictures these days and you think to yourself, where are the fish? Because there's no fish. And, but people swimming around then weren't, weren't thinking that way. They were just thinking, look at the beautiful corals and the beautiful coral reef. And then when the diadema came, uh, died off, we found out that that was the last remaining herbivore in those reefs. So any natural mortality of the acroporas and the corals was immediately met with uh, by being grown over by algae, and it was just a ratchet, just kept ratcheting. Every time the coral died, the algae um, went in, and the corals weren't able to recover. So, um, for the Great Barrier Reef, um, it's probably the the major issues are probably associated with water quality um, that are associated with land use changes since European colonization. Um, these the data I think I presented are are really good. Um, sort of give really nice empirical weight to the fact that we really need to do something to clean up the water quality on the Great Barrier Reef. And I think um, because the acroporids, the, the fast-growing branching corals, aren't as um, able to tolerate sediment and nutrient-rich um, waters, um, we need to clean up the water quality, I think, to get back to, um, to thinking about facilitating the recruitment of these corals again. Okay, in my last little uh, couple of minutes, I'll just sort of address uh, Morton Bay as a potential uh, refuge for assisted migration. I don't, I don't put this up as a straw person. Um, I put this up because uh, several people have commented on the potential for Great Barrier Reef corals to be transported in a southerly direction um, as climate change intensifies uh, in the north and potentially moving these populations down south. Uh, some people, uh, there's a paper in PLUS One that is actually recommending uh, Red Sea corals to be transported to the Great Barrier Reef uh, because it's much cooler on the GBR. Than they, so these are, this is not a straw person. This is a, these are real, this is a real issue. And Morton Bay has been identified as a great place because you know, this is those bands of reefs that I talked about earlier that we sampled. You know, we had fossil reefs here before, so why not bring some of these corals down to Morton Bay and establish some viable uh, populations? Assisted migration is, uh, can basically take several different uh, forms. You can uh, have a move a population from, this is in North America, so uh, from its southern uh, populations further north. Uh, within its range. You can take uh, disjunct populations and move the southern populations up to the north, or you can take populations that are only restricted uh, in one area and move them uh, further north into core. So there's different sort of um, uh, things that people have uh, put forth for assisted migration. By the way, there's a really good paper on assisted migration and the summary of it in last week's issue of Science in that special section on vanishing faunas. Uh, that gives you a nice background on um, assisted migration. So what, what about Morton Bay? Um, is it suitable or not? <clears throat> well, remember, we went through the history and we showed that the coral communities or the reef growth is sensitive not only to natural uh, changes but also to anthropogenic changes. Uh, we know that, that presently there's few places in Morton Bay that actually support these branching acropora corals. And presumably those are the corals that we'd want to bring down from the GBR because they're the main structural uh, builders for the GBR. Um, also the fact that we're restricting corals away from the shallow habitats means that there's very much reduced area now where corals actually live within Morton Bay. 
you probably see where I'm going with this. Uh, and, and the subtropical habitat was conducive to, to coral growth only 50% of the time in the past anyway. Now, does that sound like a place where you'd like to send your children to school? I don't think so. Right? Those, those factors are, are pretty much argue against um, bringing, bringing corals down to, um, to Morton Bay. And I think it, it, it's maybe an easy answer there, although um, I suspect we'll, we'll be having some um, issues with that uh, in the future. But I think more broadly, it's, it's helpful to consider environmental history um, in response to climate change when you're thinking about moving taxa. And I don't, I don't see any difference between the, the land or the sea. If you're thinking about moving populations or move, moving species, you really have to consider the environmental history of the area uh, that you are um, translocating to. Uh, and in the case of reefs, we really have to consider the stability of these reefs over uh, longer term time scales. So, um, conclusions are the same as I started. Ecology matters. Um, the ecological structure of coral communities we, we showed, I think, was re remarkably persistent. It wasn't uh, not due to sort of random um, or demogra demographic stochasticity. And I think this is good information when we try to think about uh, interpreting how our baselines have been shifted, how our environments have been degraded the interruption of this long-term persistence in many places around the world. I've got other examples as well, but not the time to, to tell you about them. So I really think that they should impinge on our, our conservation strategies, that they'll be enhanced when we take into account uh, these more long-term view of coral reefs and other ecosystems. Thank you very much.